I'm going to just tell you this. I wanted to start this video going waka, waka, waka. <laughs> I'm feeling silly today. I don't know why, but um, today I am so excited because we get to hear from Mark Sabas today and we're going to talk about him, his background, his teaching, his life of philosophy, as well as his new book, Monarch. And just in case people haven't read about Monarch, um, we're going to give you a little a summary of it. Just a second. Oh, boy. And so Monarch is literally about a gifted child named Samuel Helen, a young man who with extraordinary abilities and who's being held captive in a facility with children with similar abilities and they're all being subjected to cruel experiments. And this, this book has been praised for the level of imagination and the deep philosophical tones. It's even been compared to Harry Potter and Dark Materials that is amazing. So Mark, everybody unmute their mics and and, and welcome Mark. Thank you, Erica. Hey, Mark. hey Terry. Hey John. Did you hear that? Hello, hello. Hear did you what? hear? Oh, when we talked about yeah. your book. Oh yeah, I heard that. Yeah, you did a great job. Yeah, this wow. is my I know, I, level, the monarch. All right. And uh, it is, so you did a good job summarizing it. I mean, I could go into more detail well, if you want, but it we'll is about- Go into more detail. Give us some more. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, lots of people have asked me about the title, uh, The Monarchs. And well, we'll get into some symbolism behind that, but uh, it is about a group of new youth children who were born into a war ravaged world with abnormally large eyes and extraordinary psychic abilities. So there's many psychic abilities talked about in this book. Um, now the title, well, there's a whole story that develops from there. The protagonist is 17 years old. His name is Samuel and he is being tested in a uh, military facility um, that tests this group of new, new youth children for their psychic abilities. The, it's a hero's journey. So the protagonist, he has lots of flaws. It's told in first person. Um, and it's really, it's about his journey of spiritual awakening and learning how to uh, control his abilities. Now, uh, the title, The Monarchs, is, uh, I've already gotten certain questions about that. It, now, people in this community who know about my labs who know about monarch programming who know about mk ultra and uh the montauk project uh they will pick up on certain things in this book that probably many others won't because that is referenced in this book i mean the protagonist samuel he he essentially he's abducted by the military he goes to uh, the my lab programs uh they test children for psychic abilities for People who don't know, this was actually based on a real event, uh, the Montauk Project, probably other events as well, but that's been spoken about heavily in this community by survivors of the Montauk Project. Stranger Things was based off of that, and this book as well is semi-based off of it. Um, for Actually, what's really weird is I received... I say received this book because it almost came like a download 10 years ago back in 2014. And back then, I really didn't know anything about this. It's just kind of something that came to me intuitively. The whole story, even the, the uh, characters' names came to me. It's just something that I had to express. Um, it, I didn't, you know, so I got the original ideas and outline for it 10 years ago. I tried to write it back then. It just wasn't the time and there was a lot going in my life going on in my life so i delayed it several years and several years and then you know a few years ago i got that urge to express it again what i the original outline that i received back then and that resulted in this book uh the monarch so 
it is about new youth children being tested. The concept of new youth children was uh, inspired, by the way, by indigo children. It also references star seeds, especially at the end. It is going to be a trilogy. Uh, the whole book is not only about kids being tested. Uh, something I won't spoil it, but um, there is this rogue group of new youth children who uh, stage a, a, an attack, and Samuel and his love interest Evelyn have to go on a whole odyssey, a whole hero's journey, where Samuel essentially um, learns uh, how to control his abilities. But it is through the acquisition of spiritual wisdom, of uh, uh, philosophical wisdom. So. In a sense, you could call this book science fiction, but I would more aptly describe it as metaphysical or visionary fiction in that it does have, and this was my main purpose with writing this book, it does have real life, a lot of real life uh, spiritual wisdom incorporated within the pages. I know lots of people are in this community are coming out with books. It's a great way to uh, get messages out into the world, and I applaud that. This one is a bit different in that it is still truth, but it's truth within fiction. And it is an entire uh, hero's journey. And Samuel uh, meets many great friends and uh, arrives at, eventually arrives at this sanctuary. And I won't give away the whole plot, but there's romance in it. There's humor. There's lots of action. It's action packed. So I did want to make it appealing to a large commercial audience, but uh, like I said, those people in this community will pick up on certain things that others won't. Um, like I mentioned, it does mention my labs, but the monarch symbol, which has been corrupted and inverted like many symbols have, um, it also, the original blueprint of that symbol is spiritual transformation. And although it does represent, allude to monarch programming, um, I won't deny that. I did want to kind of revert the symbol of the monarch butterfly. And you'll see why I use that symbol when you read the, the book. But I did want to re revert that uh, to its original positive blueprint of uh, spiritual awakening and a spiritual transformation. And a great line in this book is um, when the characters, wise characters, tell Samuel uh, there, there, Samuel meets many wise characters. One is his tutor, Walter, at the facility where he's, he is tested. Um, and um, he also meets many characters along uh, his journey that give him uh, wisdom. And one of them tells him that, uh, expresses the idea that we are all dream characters in the mind of God. And I think, you know, this is an appropriate analogy for the book. Samuel ultimately discovers this sort of metacognitive awareness as a sort of character in the novel, in the novel itself, um, and awakens to the fact that he and all others are, in a sense, simply playing characters, but never truly disconnected uh, from God, uh, from, in a sense, to use an analogy of the book, from uh, the author. So I think that's an appropriate analogy for uh, spiritual awakening is kind of realizing um, that we are all simply uh, playing characters here. Uh, I'm playing the character of Mark. You're playing the character of uh, Erica and uh, Jonathan and Terry. And, uh, you know, we have these egoic characters, but is that who we truly are underneath uh, the character? So I studied uh, philosophy. I love getting into deep conversations such as this, but I truly think just like Samuel realizes ultimately at the end without getting too much away, he ultimately comes to this uh, realization that he is at forever connected with this God consciousness, expressing it himself itself through him and through all other characters and awakens to the fact that in a sense, it is one consciousness um, at the highest level, it is one consciousness in, interacting with itself in a way <laughs> through the different expressions, through the different uh, characters. And I think we could uh, take that up a level and we could realize in a sense that we are uh, also 
playing dream characters in the mind of God, in the mind of the universal or divine consciousness, or whatever terminology uh, you want to call it. So that is the main message, but there's also a lot of other cool things uh, within this novel. It talks about a lot of psychic abilities, remote view, that it is based off a lot of my own experiences. So we could get into some of my own experiences as well, but- uh, well, That's you- something I was going to ask you was where Samuel is connected to the God consciousness, how is Samuel connected to you? What What reflection of yourself is in this book as- what character are you samuel are you uh in all the characters are you that's a great question erica in a sense i as the author express myself different aspects of myself within all the characters even the shadow aspects so i am in samuel i won't claim to have extraordinary telekinesis (laughs) like samuel has that's samuel's main ability but some of the um experiences are actually based off my own. So I've been through uh, my own spiritual awakening. I've um, always been guided by synchronicity. I've learned to get out of my mind and into my heart more, which is, you know, a big leap of faith for a lot of men to learn to trust your heart, trust your intuition and lead by faith, which is one of Samuel's main lessons as he learns to lead by faith rather than the mind and follow synchronicity. But uh, lots of Samuel's experience are, are some of the, these experiences in the book are actually based off my own. Um, some of the um, I've uh, especially with the big theme in the book, it has lots of different sub themes, by the way, which we could get into. But a big theme is lucid dreaming and also astral projection. And the fact that the idea that we're all kind of living in this lucid dream and that is something that helped wake me up to the power of consciousness and spiritually awaken in general. Years ago, back actually when I was in high school, I taught myself how to uh, lucid dream. And that led to uh, astral projection, um, which kind of just started happening to me. Um, lots of people ask the difference between lucid dreaming and astral projection. There's not really so much of a thick line between the two, but in a sense, it could feel so real that it's essentially having an out-of-body experience. And I've uh, encountered uh, beings while in the astral realm, both uh, positive and negative, uh, you could say. And some of those experiences in the book, such as, for example, Samuel encountering a shadow being um, and uh, other beings while uh, in the astral realm, that's one of his abilities. That's that's uh, based off my uh, own experiences. But there's a, a lot of different other psychic abilities talked about in the book, uh, telekinesis, telepathy, remote viewing. I've also been interested for uh, for years. I was trained last year uh, by the Farsight Institute viewing. If if uh, you've heard of them, they're a great civilian institute. I've always been interested in the power of consciousness and the idea that we are all these expressions of the divine universal consciousness, and we could kind of attune to this higher consciousness and activate uh, certain abilities. So that's been my journey. These Really these past years through my spiritual awakening, through practices such as transcendental meditation, uh, Qigong has been great for me. I've been practicing Qigong this past year, uh, remote viewing. I've been, I'm part of uh, Tony Rodriguez's uh, remote viewing group. Uh, that's been great. Uh, lucid dreaming and, uh, and astral projection as well. That has led to many really cool experiences for me. Uh, I've had experiences with uh, with telepathic communication. Um, so lots of concepts, uh, really cool concepts are in this book. Um, so uh, another big theme, by the way, I wanted to mention is uh, I'm also love music. I mean, who doesn't love music? But this book does incorporate lots of real music, uh, lyrics within it. And the Samuel's tutor, Walter, in a sense, is named after Walter Russell. Uh, he was me- recently mentioned on that oh, podcast. Wow. Yeah, with uh, Terrence Howard. About the, the, the elemental chart, right? Right, right. And how every element has a certain tone. Well, Walter Russell 
inspired this idea of the musical theory of the universe, how everything can be expressed through vibration, sound, and geometry. If you look at uh, somatics, where they use a certain vibration to vibrate sound particles and cause certain sacred geometric, geometric shapes, that is an expression of this idea. So this idea is very prevalent throughout the monarchs that everything is expressed through music um, and it manifests itself in the inclusion. I, I included many, there's many, let's just say synchronicities and Easter eggs and lots of symbolism and stuff to decipher in this novel. Um, and one of those is music. For um, So there's references to real uh, music lyrics in this novel uh, for specific reasons. For uh, There's certain songs, for example, that when you decipher the message behind it, it may, it may actually contain a hidden uh, message pertaining to the story. So there's music lyrics from the Beatles, Fleetwood Mac, um, Jimi Hendrix is a big one. Um, so many other uh, bands and artists. And I, I actually had to receive permission to, to use all these. Oh, wow. That's awesome. I was wondering if you went that far. Yeah. Right, to use all these print uh, music lyrics. So I received permission for maybe like 24, I think it was, different songs <laughs> to use in my novel. So for fans of music um, and uh I mean, who isn't a fan of music, right? <laughs> but they, they'll discover an added dimension within this uh, within this novel. Um, and I really, you know, it was kind of tough because my editor, um, you know, she said like, hey, you can't just use all this music. You got to get permission. But she loved the idea and she really wanted me to go for it and receive permission. And that was a whole journey in itself. But I'm kind of glad that I did because... Uh, that is another central theme in this book. So it kind of blends many different unique themes. I'd like to think it's a unique blend genre crossing book between science fiction, visionary fiction, uh, dystopian fiction, and uh, music as well, and paranormal, supernatural, psychic ability <laughs> uh, fiction. So it's a, I, I think it's a very unique book and it's going to be a trilogy and it, it does take place on kind of a dystopian timeline where the planet has been ravaged by war. But I do want to stress that it's just a uh, one timeline and uh, that, is, that will be made clearer within book two, where it's going to get into a lot more of the extraterrestrial stuff, which is alluded to at the end and a lot more into Past well, life. we gotta pull you back. We gotta pull you back because you uh I say I didn't know that you know if we pull the string, your motor <laughs> you can go. Yeah, this is amazing. But we can tell that you're passionate about it. That's Thank that's you. amazing. And oh wow, that's really cool that you got the rights for 24 different songs. Like there's a lot rolling through my mind. And one of the main things is the word hero, because you, you talked about the hero journey for Samuel. And I get kind of a sense of a, sup, a hidden superhero personality inside you that you would like to express. Is Samuel the hero that you desire to be? Yes. Now, the hero's journey is, I think, a blueprint that many of us are on our own souls are on. It is also the story of Christ. Sorry. So the hero's journey is a character is, you know, born with flaws, uh, personality defects, let's just say, and within a certain comfort zone and that comfort zone is burst and they go on a whole journey into the unknown and meet certain friends that help them along the way. And the hero acquires wisdom to overcome their personality defects and ultimately uh, come back, in a sense, come back home uh, to who they truly are uh, as, uh, let's just say, a divine uh, expression or a divine soul, as, as Samuel ultimately realized, as they overcome the challenges and obstacles, which is really what we're all doing on earth. We're here to learn certain lessons, and we're not, each of us are flawed, right? We're not perfect. Believe me, I have many uh, flaws uh, personality defects, but instead of, you know, playing the victim and, and, you know, um, complaining, to, uh, that we are put in here into a callous universe that 
uh, doesn't care about us and we're, uh, we have so many challenges and obstacles that come our way, one of the biggest lessons, and this is also talked about uh, heavily in the book, is taking every challenge as an, an opportunity. So every obstacle that comes our way, uh, I believe, you know, I, I also believe that uh, in a way uh, our souls or our, our higher expressions, our higher selves, this is also alluded to in the book, are kind of spiritually orchestrating certain events behind the scenes uh, for us to learn certain lessons, for us to have certain encounters. And the lesson is going to keep, I mean, the challenge or the obstacle or the theme that we're facing is going to keep repeating in sort of a karmic cycle until yeah. we break that cycle, until we learn uh, the lesson. So that is also- but There's, there. a, there's an undercurrent that drives us to continue to learn that lesson, the undercurrent that- <laughs> we create yeah we create for ourselves so i love that so can i i just so the characters that you have would you say that they represent the major art archetypes yes yes they, they do represent kind of in a young in sense yeah they do represent major uh archetypes now samuel he is of course a hero and he does kind of he does of course represent the the hero archetype but the flawed hero and there is allusions to um christ to jesus in this novel there's clear and open uh, uh jesus and christ or the christ consciousness is clearly alluded to and samuel has to go through his own hero's journey and by the end he is more uh, in tune with this christed aspect this christ consciousness which I believe is uh, within every single uh, one of us. But there are other uh, archetypes in the book. Of course, the villain, uh, there's multiple villains. Uh, but one of the, uh, the, the villain that I think most clearly represents uh, the hero's journey archetype is uh, Mateo. And he leads this group of kind of uh, radicalized, violent uh, new youth children. Um, and he is an expression of kind of what of Samuel's shadow aspect. And this is uh, very clearly alluded to in the book. He is kind of what Samuel uh, could become if he lets his anger, if he lets his fear and emotion uh, drive him uh, instead of learning the lesson. So uh, Mateo is very much like Samuel with his uh, powerful telekinetic abilities, but he has made different choices uh, in his life. And that's really what the hero's uh, journey um, best represents is the villain uh, should be in a sense a lot like uh, the hero, but the villain uh, represents uh, kind of what the, the the flawed aspects of the hero. So the hero uh, needs to see uh, the villain in him and vice versa. Um, so that is uh, very clearly there's the hero archetype and then there's a villain uh, shadow archetype at play here, Walter Samuel's tutor. He kind of represents the um, the old uh, teacher uh, archetype, um, and there's lots of different uh, characters along the journey, and they all represent, I guess, some aspect, uh, some aspect of uh, of of wisdom uh, that Samuel uh, comes across. Uh, one of the main characters as well, Luna. Uh, she is uh, one of the most uh, powerful and eccentric characters in the book. And she's also very, very funny. <laughs> so that's where a lot of the humor comes in. She kind of represents in a, in a weird way, she kind of represents the fool archetype in that she is always uh, cracking jokes and she's very sarcastic, but uh, she's also very, very, uh, Samuel discovers uh, Luna is very, one, probably the wisest character uh, in the book under, in the most, powerful character in the book underneath that kind of facade of being kind of like a fool um because a fool really is uh, a fool archetype that's actually a very supposed to be very wise so i say that luna represents a, a certain archetype and there's lots of uh, symbolism as well um you know this book is, is it's really loaded with uh with um with symbolism and i think every character like we were alluding to earlier every character kind of represents a different um, aspect i don't know maybe of my subconscious but i think uh you know larger archetypes in general of the collective uh consciousness are 
very clearly represented here because this is very clearly uh, a hero's journey as Samuel uh, overcomes his challenges and uh, learns to connect with his true self and true, uh, I guess you could say, uh, Christ in nature and arrive back. Uh, it's, it's an odyssey and he, he uh, I don't want to give it away, but in a sense, he kind of uh, arrives back home and realizes that uh, the treasure uh, that he's been seeking is within, within him uh, all along. But um, so it's really cool. Um, <laughs> so uh, it is about, you know, spiritual awakening, but uh, there's lots of it's action packed. There's lots of even if people aren't on a spiritual journey, I think they'll still find it entertaining. And it does allude as well to by the end, it does allude to kind of the whole extraterrestrial aspect and the whole star seed thing as well, which I'm going to get more into in uh, book two. So, but yeah, great, great question so far. I'm, I'm very excited for, for its release, by the way, it's going to be released this month on uh, June 25th. And it's, it's already available to order from major retailers from Amazon, Barnes and Noble, et cetera. And like you mentioned, Erica, just a little promotion. It has been getting a uh, good review so far, favorable reviews from all the, independent uh, reviewers that I sent it to I actually just received one today that was uh, favorable uh, that appeared on uh, in LA Weekly as well, which was pretty cool. So it yeah. is very smart that you went through the trouble to do the reviewers. Um, yeah, I, I, tr <laughs> I had an opportunity to encourage people to do that before. Like it's best to get your book listed somewhere and get it read by people uh, who can can do that for you. I think it's remarkable that you've, you've really gone the route to do that, to really dig in and be committed to it. Because I think a lot of people, like they write a book, but then they don't really know what to do with it. And it's like, well, how do I get people to see my book and hear my book? But you've done it. Yes. Um, <laughs> one of the things, because we're talking about heroes and villains, I got a couple of questions I want to stack up on you. And it really is about you and your childhood heroes. Like, who were your childhood heroes? Because I, I'm wondering if that plays into this this hero's journey that Samuel is on, and you know the fact that Samuel is becoming the hero that you desire to be yourself. And so, whether it be superheroes and villains on television or just in your life, I guess it opens up the mindset of Mark as a child, where your mindset was when it came to heroes and villains. Is this something you desired for yourself to be spectacular, to be a hero, to save the world, to, to be remarkable in some way? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I do desire to be remarkable. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, it's a balance, you know, you have to, uh, you know, I don't really know where the motivation and the inspiration comes from sometimes, but I think in a way you have to, in order to get the inspiration, you have to let the ego step aside and just allow whatever comes to come. So uh, where the inspiration came from, you know, that's, Kind of up to debate, but it was, you know, some of my childhood heroes. It was, I was really into X-Men as a kid. I yeah. got this book is semi uh, uh, inspired by X-Men. Um, so that's something that I really loved. And it, 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 the initial outline was inspired by uh, X-Men. I was um, some other of my childhood heroes. I, I was really into, uh, I was a huge Lakers fan, even though I live on the La uh, East Coast. But I was uh, really into, uh, you know, Kobe Bryant and, and they won the whole uh, three-peat. Uh, so I was a huge uh, basketball fan and Kobe Bryant fan in general. Um, so I would, you know, I, I looked up to to him as well. And um, and just the way his, his mentality and just the way he always persevered uh, despite any obstacles. And he was, I think he was so graceful even on the, the basketball court. So, of course, every young man in, in, every, uh, in this, uh, in America looks up to, sports figures Kobe was was probably mine uh, but just in a more general sense um, you know I've always looked up to my parents my parents were both immigrants my mom was an immigrant from uh, Italy from Calabria from a poor town in Italy and my grandfather moved here uh, barely speaking English when he was um, 
30, no, when he was 40 years old and he, he had his, he made his own construction company and he really made it in America while not knowing a lick of English at first. And, um, him and my grand, my grandfather and my grandma, my nono and my nonna, they were, uh, I think they're true heroes as well as my mother who came as a 10 year old girl. And really she also did uh, very well for, for herself. Now on my father's side, my father, comes from a Greek Jewish uh, family. Uh, that is a real thing, Greek, uh, because you know, the large majority these days of, of Greeks are uh, actually Jewish. Greek Orthodox. So there, mm -hmm. but there's a very tiny min minority of Greek Jewish uh, people still living in Greece. My father is one of them. He's a Greek a Greek Jewish immigrant. He commutes back and forth from uh, Greece and to from Greece and uh, America. And he comes from a Greek Jewish family that survived the Holocaust, even though 90% of the Greek Jews in that country were wiped out and most of the other ones still uh, moved. So it's a very tiny uh, community there. But I am kind of proud of that uh, aspect. You know, one of my great uncles, he actually is kind of semi-famous and you can look him up for uh, escaping. Uh, I think he escaped on the trains. He, he was in Auschwitz and he was the first one to arrive back at the country. And he was telling everybody about the crazy things that they were doing, and no one believed him at first. Oh wow! So my father came from uh, that family. Uh, most of his extended family died, but he was, uh, and in a sense, that uh, you know, they are heroes because they really uh, survive. Not only survived, but they really uh, did great for themselves. My grandfather was a chemist, and my father was. Uh, he came as an immigrant as well to study in America, and he is a uh, physicist, or he worked as a physicist. Actually, during the 80s, he worked as a nuclear physicist in the, for a few years at Los Alamos National Labs, which if you don't know, that's where apparently Bob Lazar and some other people worked as a physicist uh, during the 80s. He later transitioned my father to a medical physics, but he did uh, uh, receive his PhD in, in nuclear physics. So he's a very, very intelligent uh, person. And I really, uh, he was very hardworking as well. And he, he uh, He's very, um, he's always uh, really um, loved me and my twin brother. So I've always. Oh my God, you have a twin. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I have a twin brother that's a lot taller than me. Uh, six, two, six, three. So <laughs> you met me, I'm not that tall, but he, he's a fraternal uh, twin brother. So, yep. Uh, <laughs> that, that's almost, big, my, that's big, like, uh, Benjamin. that's like, whoa. And so what? What effect, like with, with all the scientists in your family, um, how did that shape your education? Like, did you, were you free to study what you liked or were you encouraged to get into the sciences or? Oh yeah, I was very left brain, mathematical, scientific as a kid. Uh, I won't deny that. I was raised, you know, in a family of scientists and, and, and on my mom's side as well, there's engineers. So I was very pushed into uh, science, you know, with science fairs and all that. And I did um, uh, go to school initially for computer science engineering at uh, Bucknell University in Pennsylvania. Uh, then uh, I kind of, at the same time, I was kind of going through a weird phase in my life. I was also around that time is when, you know, I began experimenting with lucid dreaming and all that. And I was kind of, I was going through a, a spiritual awakening and I just, decided that that path of uh, engineering, computer science engineering, that really wasn't for me. There weren't any girls in the class either. So that really, that was probably the biggest factor. So I, I really, uh, I dropped out of that program and I began to study philosophy instead. I also have an economics degree, but I double majored in philosophy and economics. And that was a great, really, uh, there's lots of problems with the education system, of course, but majoring in philosophy really taught me how to think and how to how to think for myself, which is more important uh, than ever uh, these days. So uh, one of my big purposes here that I feel I should be doing is merging uh, science and spirituality, because not many people and uh, science, and, you know, and consciousness and metaphysics and spirituality at all. There's some level where it all merges and blends together, and not many people realize just how uh, you know. Um, how much weird stuff is within some of the new science that we're seeing, such as the new uh, 
uh, quantum physics that we're seeing. There's a reason why many of the great pioneers of quantum physics, uh, uh, Schrodinger, Wigner, uh, von Neumann, uh, you name it, they were interested, Heisenberg, they were interested in, um, in um, uh, mysticism. In fact, one of the uh, Nobel Prize winning physicists, Wolfgang Pauli, he, uh, he and uh, Carl Jung developed, uh, the, he termed uh, synchronicity. So he was trying to uh, develop a relationship, a model between synchronicity and quantum entanglement. There's lots of really weird stuff in quantum physics, um, quantum entanglement, quantum tunneling, uh, the observer effect that kind of defies a materialist explanation, which means, you know, the materialist view is that we're kind of just in this random universe that came from nothing and that our consciousness is just some accidental byproduct of these trillions of cells accidentally or organizing themselves <laughs> into this uh, miracle of consciousness, which is absolute nonsense, you know, and that we're not, uh, we're, consciousness is just byproduct of the, of the brain and that we're detached uh, from the world. Well, that has proven, been proven not only, you know, by ancient mystics, but also in modern uh if you really look at the experiments they've been doing in quantum physics, which completely defy that worldview, that has also the materialist worldview has been disproven. And there's many uh, great uh, pioneers of quantum physics up till this day who, who assert that um, the, what mystics, that what mystics have been asserting for thousands of years, that there's an aspect of consciousness that is uh, fundamental to this universe and universal, meaning it pervades all things and i'm very happy to see that these theories are gaining more and more mainstream credibility because of course uh through our own experiences yeah uh, be it visionary or psychic experiences uh we know that this is true for example i practice remote viewing and remote viewing can't be possible without an aspect of consciousness that transcends the body and is connected to all points of space and time so um, we know this is true from our own experiences that consciousness is more than just a brain, that we are uh, connected to this world, uh, to our own perceptions in a way, everything we perceive, there's nothing we could perceive without consciousness. Consciousness is uh, like all the philosophers said, consciousness is the one thing we can truly uh, know. There is no, and this is what quantum physics says as well, there really is no outside world without uh, consciousness. So we are intrinsically linked with our perceptions in a way we kind of live, I think, in a dreamlike universe um, where observation and creation go hand in hand. We're constantly interacting with the quantum field of probabilities. Uh, and in a sense, I do believe in a sense that we do manifest our, our reality and hence uh, synchronicity comes in as well. So that's one thing that I'm very uh, interested in. And I'll, I'll continue uh, to pursue. Great that's question. Fascinating. That's very fascinating, Mark. And uh, I was wondering, so with Qigong and your whole spiritual, bridging spirituality and science together, did you, were you able to craft that within the book and, and your experience with uh, Qigong? Great question. Um, Qigong is something that's been relatively new to me. I've been doing it for a little over a year now, uh, but it really is about, you know, opening up and, uh, and it's really been a revelation. It's about opening up the energy centers in our body and uh, really connecting to ourselves, connecting with our body and letting the energy flow uh, up and down our spine, our spinal centers and opening up uh, those energetic centers which I believe does lead to certain activation of certain uh, spiritual capabilities as well. Uh, and um, so my Qigong, I've been practicing Korean style Qigong with two instructors they are actually based in Korea. And it's all about the breath and it's all about uh, certain movements and certain uh, flow uh, uh, movements that really activate the uh, Kundalini energy, the Qi within the body and you could feel it just exper experientially uh you could uh feel it and it, it is uh as well expressed in the book as samuel does go through kind of a kundalini awakening uh in the book and feels this energy um 
go up and down his spine. Uh, my, my Qigong masters, they do talk about the chakras and they uh, help me and many others to open up their own chakras for uh, energy centers. Uh, we have seven centers up and down the spine. And I do believe that that's very uh, important for us to connect, uh, treat our body as a temple, as a divine temple, and realize that there's certain um, energetic uh, connections that we can make within our body. So many men especially are trapped in their head, are trapped in their ego. Uh, one big thing for me has, has been opening up the green ray center, which is the heart chakra, uh, connecting more with the heart and uh, the higher energy centers as well. But the lower energy centers, the root and the sacral chakra, those are also very heavily emphasized in the Qigong tradition uh, because we, we do need to ground within our centers and we need to uh, overcome kind of our fears and open up the root chakra and have healthy uh, uh, emotional boundaries and sexual boundaries, which is in the sacral chakra, have self-confidence, which is in the, the uh, solar plexus and so on and so forth. So you do want to have kind of a balanced energy system uh, throughout your body, which is what Qigong helps you to do. Uh, but I think for a big theme in the society is trying to keep people trapped kind of in their lower chakras and not allowing the energy to flow up into the more, you could say, spiritualized uh, energy centers and keep them trapped in lust, in uh, greed, in competition, in violence, in fear. Those energies keep us trapped in the lower emotional centers. Really, if we want to activate the higher mind, the higher intelligence, we have to allow the higher center, the energy to flow up into the higher centers and place our awareness there. That is all about kind of overcoming the uh, the uh, corpor that you can say the temptations of the, the corporeal body. Um, it is you know healthy to uh, we are human, of course, but uh, we don't we um, have to realize that uh, there's certain uh, energy centers, higher energy centers. And it's really revelation uh, once you realize just uh, the amount of wisdom and knowledge that we all have within ourselves, within our hearts, within our um, uh, higher energy uh, chakras, the third eye, the crown chakra. Once we really uh, open up these centers, which you could feel, then you start receiving, which I've uh, had experience with. I'm sure uh, many other people have as well. We could start receiving uh, intuition, internal uh, guidance and it's really constant. You're more in tune with yourself, with your internal nudges. You're guided by these small whispers uh, that come from your heart. These synchronicities, uh, and you're really guided by that uh, that voice of intuition. You have to discern, you know, where those voice, voice, those voices come from. But uh, that takes uh, practice, and also with remote qigong and remote viewing practice, I have. Um, uh, uh, become, I've, I'm already naturally sensitive, but I have become a much more uh, in tune with that voice and kind of attuned to those higher energy centers. And I'm uh, guided by, you know, uh, those nudges. I receive uh, visions a lot, uh, just flashes of things within my mind's eye. Uh, you know, I can't say where that comes from, but it always uh, could come from your higher self, from guides. Uh, but once you really open to that guidance system, then I think you're much more in tune with uh, higher, letting a higher intelligence guide you throughout your life. And that's one of the main, bringing it back to the book, that's one of the main lessons that Samuel has to learn as well. So once you realize we're always being guided in a sense, we have aspects of ourselves that are uh, beyond space and time that are guiding us. We're much more than just this human ego, this human personality. It's very arrogant, I think, to think otherwise. We're not the ones who who uh, beat our own hearts or or grow us from a, a child to an adult. There's a higher intelligence that's constantly working through us and, and guiding us. And a big part of the journey of faith and uh, is to surrender and trust uh, to that higher guidance and to that letting intuition uh, guide you more than the mind because the ego mind is thinks it knows and, and controls everything but that's really uh, <laughs> nonsense you have to the, we all have an ego but we have to put in it in its place and that's part of what 
awakening is all about is realizing that there's a higher intelligence guiding your actions and uh, surrendering to that and letting yourself be guided by whatever um, wonderful uh, surprises come your way and synchronicities. So yeah, great question. Oh, can't hear you guys. We, we talked about heroes. And so I wanted to get into some villains, even in your real life and in the book, um, dealing with villains, sympathy, empathy, um, anything you would like to express on those lines with dealing with villains, people, they feel guilty when they have to defend themselves or when they have to um, protect themselves. But then also too, I guess when I watch television, I always see the, the, the villain and he has an excuse that people can sympathize with why he did this. And, and so then the villain becomes this sympathetic actual uh, protagonist of the book <laughs> rather than the antagonist. Is there anything like this in your book or even in your life where you've seen people as the villain, but then maybe realize that they really weren't the villain after all? Yes, we all have villains in our life and that does express itself in a story. And the best villains are the ones that you can have empathy for because I don't believe that any person, one person is just truly a born evil for the sake of being evil. We all go through our own journeys and some people make different decisions. I do believe some people are placed on our paths to be our own personal villains in the hero's journey for us to learn and for us to kind of have a catalyst for us to grow. And that is alluded to in the book when Samuel kind of realizes that the own, uh, his own villains, not only Mateo, the other a new youth, but also General Mabus, uh, the, the uh, lead, leader of the military faction, who is the one who uh, tortured and imprisoned him. Uh, they realize that he, uh, you know, he also, um, they, in a sense, Samuel realizes that uh, empathy and forgiveness are two of the greatest teachers and uh, powers in this world that we all need right now more than ever, especially in this society and this cancel culture that just, um, you know, denigrates uh, any idea of, of forgiveness. But uh, Samuel in, in this book as well, so in the book and real life, this is true. We need to learn to empathize and ultimately um, forgiveness it, it, it stops in a way uh, the wheel of karma. Forgiveness is what uh, helps us to learn our lessons and transcend these karmic uh, cycles that we keep repeating. Forgive it, forgiveness of not only other people, but forgiveness of ourselves. So we have to realize that each person is on their own journey. They have different perspectives than us. And there's stuff that they've been through that might make them a certain way that we initially don't like, and we may see them as a villain, but from a higher perspective, uh, they really are our greatest uh, teachers. So yes, there has been a people uh, like that in my own life who I really, uh, I, for lack of a better word, have been nasty to me, uh, but part of my own uh, journey has been learning to see them as, a, as someone who is some people who are wounded and have been through their own journey, been through their own uh, traumas and learn to forgive and learn to have empathy for people because too often we just judge people based off and judge ourselves based off our previous actions and based on uh, our shadow selves. We, we all have a shadow self, um, which is kind of the embodiment of all our <laughs> personality defects and worst character flaws. And we've all been there. We've all been in a sense, our own shadow or our own uh, villain. And what we don't like in other people is often what we don't like uh, in ourselves. And that's what Samuel in the book, he realizes that as well. He learns to forgive himself. And because he's been through a lot of trauma, uh, Samuel, the character in my book, he's been through a lot of trauma. I won't give it away, but he has to learn to heal that trauma in a sense through uh, forgiveness of himself and forgiveness of others. And that's what um, transcends 
uh, the cycle by seeing these people at, by empathizing with them and what they've been through and from a higher perspective, real, realizing that they really are trying to, uh, you know, their egos might not realize it, but I truly do believe that from a higher level, from a soul level, there is a purpose for our own villains being in our lives to help us to be a catalyst uh, for us to learn certain lessons, to be a catalyst uh, for our own growth. Yeah. So. Terry, did you have something you were about to say or I saw you get excited for a moment? OK, so you discussed already the fact that what we see in others and we what we don't like in others is usually something that we see in ourselves. And the fact that we do need to have self-forgiveness. And it's easy for us to see someone else as the villain in our own story. Have you ever seen that you were the villain in your own story? Not necessarily what you did to anyone else, where maybe you have to forgive yourself for traumatizing or hurting your own self. Or even if you see that you're the villain in someone else's story, you know? Uh, but where do you find yourself when it comes to that, that self-forgiveness and being the villain? Oh, yes. I've certainly been the villain in my own story and in other stories as well, other people's stories. There's actions of my old self that I truly, um, I truly uh, don't really, I, I, uh, I regret. Let's just say, I, of course, we all regret doing certain things and we were all villains to people at certain points in their lives. But part of self-forgiveness is realizing, and this is but Samuel bringing it back to the book again realizes as well is that in a sense, we are all born again uh, in every single moment. We have the opportunity to change. We shouldn't judge ourselves and we shouldn't also judge others simply by uh, projecting uh, kind of phantoms of the past, of their past actions, but allow ourselves and allow others as well to grow. Because if we all were judged by our worst moments in the past, then while wow, we, we will never uh, truly transcend, we will never truly grow. We have to have empathy for ourselves, realize that, yeah, we were villains for our own self, for our own uh, spiritual growth and uh, villains for uh, in other people's stories as well. That's uh, definitely uh, been the case uh, for me based on certain you know, people just, I, I didn't treat well in, in the past. And um, I regret not not treating everyone with uh, love and uh, forgiveness and, and empathy. And that's something that I continue to grow towards. But what, uh, you know, we have to allow space for people uh, to grow and to change and to be a better version of themselves. That's kind of why I really don't like a lot of this cancel cancel culture stuff going around because it just um we just judge people based on just one little thing that they do in the past and might not even be so significant but uh they're 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 canceled and we there's no room for forgiveness and there's no room uh for for growth and i truly do believe that uh you know in a sense we we have this uh ego uh, personality that we follows us wherever we go, which consists of our memories, who we think we are as a person, our role, uh, our personal history. Uh, that always follows us, certain things that we did in our past, and that can manifest in a way as our shadow self, as our, our shadow aspect of all the, the, the things that we've done. So that is our kind of, uh, Carl Jung spoke about the shadow aspect, how we all have this shadow side to ourselves and that is in a sense our own uh, villain our own nemesis but we have to have love and forgiveness for that shadow aspect and that's how we uh, transcend it as uh, transcend uh that shadow aspect as well as simply realizing that um on a deeper level we are not uh we can transcend ourselves uh we can and this goes into a very buddhist notion as well that is talked about in our book in the book as well uh, uh, in a sense, um, the self, the ego self, in a way, consisting of all our personal history, our thoughts, our memories, those mental narratives and programs that constantly fill your mind. And 
fill you uh, and uh, dictate your personality in a sense that uh, on a deeper level that is uh, illusory. That is a, a program that you're uh, continuing on in your head and you can change that program. You can pro reprogram yourself. You can reprogram your mind uh, just by really uh, in meditation, just by observing your thoughts and realizing those thoughts, those memories, they don't really define who you are. And you can make a different choice in every moment. You could kind of step out of your personal history and mental narratives that uh, sprung out of that personal history. And you could uh, transcend uh, the self in a way. You could transcend the ego and be, become a completely different person from your old self. And I barely identify really with a lot of the aspects of my, of my old self. I'm not proud of a lot of the things that I, I did, but um, in a way that that led me to uh, this realization, uh, kind of the spiritual realization of um, this transcendent aspect that we could each uh, tune into that transcends our personal history, that transcends our ego and our shadow selves. And that is uh, the true self, the unadulterated, the divine consciousness, uh, the Christic consciousness, whatever you want to call it. That is constantly working through us and it's constantly a choice whether we want to act from the ego or act from that more higher level of consciousness i find is more connected with uh with the heart center so that's very important as well in in today's day and age i just wanted to reiterate that you are totally correct when it comes to cancel culture before it used to be you're only as good as today so you could at least count on today's deeds but now it's you're only as good as your past right whatever the one thing that you did and and now you're um kicked to the curb um terry has a question um and i'll let her ask that <clears throat> so yeah, but Marcus, you're amazing with just your articulation of to the questions. It's like, wow. <laughs> but um, I, I just want to ask you, and you kind of alluded it will be in your second book, but um, based on everything that you've been talking about, do you see yourself as a star seed and or your past lives? Are the past lives that you may have had are they influencing who you are now or do you think it's more your connection with um being a star seed or or whatever yeah that's a that's a great question yeah we're gonna we're gonna delve into some of the weirder aspects <laughs> but yeah um this the, the idea of a star seed that's that's come come up uh, more and more in today's society where people feel like they're connecting their they they don't in a way they don't even feel uh, connected to their human self their human personality they feel more connected with with um, other uh, personality selves um, that are uh, connected with our overall uh, oversoul so there are I think of our oversoul kind of as this collective uh, consciousness that uh, that branches out into several. Uh, different uh, incarnations. And this is what uh, people must realize that we're much more than just this personality self, much more than just this single ego living this lifetime. We also have are connected with, uh, I believe, several different simultaneous uh, lifetimes that are occurring. Um, and so those lifetimes might not even necessarily be uh, human. Um, so I do believe that uh, lots of us here are connected with uh, higher dimensional uh, aspects of ourselves that are uh, currently bleeding through into our own uh, human selves. And uh, we are constantly uh, connecting uh, to those different uh, incarnational selves. Um, if you've ever read the Seth books, that, that talks a lot about that. But I do heavily believe in the, uh, the star seed phenomena. I do believe, um, you know, even through my own uh, personal experience, uh, I, I have, um, uh, let's just say I have uh, encountered certain beings and had certain communication within the astral uh, realm that I believe were with uh, higher dimensional beings or beings that might not even be uh, from here. And uh, they've shown me that they do uh, uh, exist and that uh, I, I think that the, they might even be a certain uh uh, incarnational aspects of, of, of myself 
that or, you know, I think we all have these aspects that are guiding us along our own uh, human journey. One one weird, we, really weird um, experience that happened to me too a few months ago. So I, I have encountered uh, several uh, beings and I do believe that I, I have had a certain communications, but there was an experience uh, uh, several uh, months ago where I was um, uh, kind of projected my consciousness from my body and I found myself uh, so this uh, really not even in uh, m- my own body. I found myself when I looked in, in a mirror, I was uh, I didn't look human and nor was I male. I was um, a female uh, figure with uh, light blue skin and these long uh, these this long hair and these eyes that looked um, very much, uh, you know, just like small galaxies. And um, so I, and I was totally lucid. It was just like an out of body experience, but um, I was in this different body, this body that wasn't a male and wasn't uh, human either. (laughs) So uh, there's uh, other aspects to that experience as well. But I do believe that that was just meant to show me, yes, you're a lot more. We're each part of these, um, soul entities that are a lot more than just this uh, human uh, personality self that we currently um, <laughs> uh, partake in. We're much more than just this one character, uh, so to speak. And we can connect with certain uh, aspects of ourselves that uh, higher aspects of ourselves that might uh, exist uh, uh, beyond our current understanding of space and time that are trying to uh, communicate with us. And I think Certain experiences such as that one were meant to show me that we are um, that this we are a lot more than than this <laughs> than this human body and that uh, lots. I think some people, you know, they might uh, take it too far with uh, with identifying, you know, as a star seed and but uh, you know, it, just a mere fact that uh, there are different incarnational existences out there that may not be human and may uh, be from different dimensions. Uh, I think our soul expresses itself. uh, And this is what uh, the Seth books say as well. The soul is a a multidimensional infinite act. And we are awakening to the fact that we are a multidimensional being. So as we awaken to the fact that we're multidimensional beings in a part of a much larger soul entity, part of a much larger older soul that has different uh, incarnational aspects, then we're going to tune into uh, those different aspects of ourselves. And uh, so some of those aspects might not be, <laughs> not, not, not even be human. And I, I do believe that several of us have kind of in a sense chosen to come here and per- participate in the human experience uh, in order to not only experience being human and learn certain lessons, but also to help um, elevate the human consciousness on earth uh, at this moment. I don't believe that this is an accident, that we're all here and we're all speaking. And that, that uh, star seed and extraterrestrial aspect is alluded to at the very end of, of uh, this book. And it's going to be spoken about a lot um, more uh, heavily in uh, books two and three. So that's a great question, Terry. So it appeared that you were saying that at this point, we are supposed to be here we have a purpose in our human existence in this lifetime but maybe it's possible that people are connecting over connecting to their star seed identity and like actually like abandoning their human identity and abandoning like the reality space that we live in right now it's like it's good that we know that we are these other things and that we've been other things but it sounds to me like you're just talking about grounding into your actual present personality at this point. Right. Yeah. I think that ultimately, you know, labels and identity is a trap. So um, it is important to realize that we have these, that we are multidimensional beings and we have these other aspects of ourselves. And uh, you know, I I do like the the star seed term and and the law of one, they, they call it uh, wander. And it, it, it is very important to awaken to the fact that we are, kind of uh, seated from the stars. We, we, we are part of this multidimensional soul that might have uh, different aspects that even come uh, from the stars. And um, uh, sorry, that was my wife. Anyway, I got distracted. No, it's all uh, right. Um, so, you can look. <laughs> <laughs> Just 
kidding. No, lost my. Parents. Like, oh, you messed me up. That yeah. is very important, but the um, the the, the it, it is also very um, important to not get so attached uh, to labels and to certain identities. Not even like the star seed identity or many people in this community. They kind of uh, identify, let, let's say, like as an Arcturian being or as a Pleiadian being, and they kind of lose. Uh, and, or it could be all the all of the above. And I do believe that's true, that we shouldn't get too yeah. uh, tied down to a certain one ego identity, because I think it's kind of, in a sense, all of the above. We are this human right. being. We're also that Arcturian being. We're that Pleiadian being. We're that uh, higher dimensional being. We have so many different aspects of ourselves. And ultimately, I think we are all of it. If you go into the highest aspect of universal consciousness, I think it is one consciousness expressing itself through a multitude of many, many, uh, many, lives many, many beings, many expressions. And that's ultimately the spiritual realization of transcending the identity of the singular identity, the ego identity, and realize that in a sense, there is no, uh, the, the, the ego is illusory. The, the, the ego itself is illusory. And uh, we are part of this universal uh, divine consciousness. And so don't get too, uh, I, I do um, resonate with the starseed phenomenon heavily. I never, uh, you know, I, I do, I've always felt kind of different. And I think a lot of that is because of these other aspects of myself uh, trying to communicate with me and influencing me. Uh, but I try not to get so attached uh, to any one uh, identity because ultimately, uh, like I said before, uh, getting too attached to a, sing a single identity, I think that's ultimately a, a trap and you have to learn to transcend that and be, because uh, um, ultimately the, the, the one identity that expresses itself throughout all things is that uh, divine universal consciousness. And that's uh, much higher, uh, I think on the, that's the highest level of identity is, the very highest level identity is that universal consciousness call it uh, divine consciousness, call it God. That is the highest level of each of our identities. But I look at it like a, as a tree, we also have um, uh, kind of our higher selves or over souls that, brand, that are expressions of that consciousness that have had several um, incarnational existences and lifetimes, uh, be it on earth or be it on other worlds or planes and dimensions. And uh, so, it's very clear. It's yeah, very it's, clear. Yeah, and I think cool. that's that's kind of why people can get stuck with the he, she, they, and the, 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 the. And it's like, yeah, but we're something way bigger than all of that. So getting trapped in even these small gender identities that people would like to flex. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, oh my God. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. That, and that comes down to people just identifying with, with their body, over identifying with their body and just this one meat suit and over identifying with these labels. And especially, you know, in this society, over identifying with, with uh, certain uh, labels that would make you out to be a, like a, a victim. And uh, I'm, I'm, right. I don't want to make, uh, no, 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 no. They're, there's nothing else to say yeah. about it. We just, yeah. <laughs> we've identified it and, and that's good. Um, um, with the level that you've delved in to expressing each character, how did they flesh themselves out? How did they, did they actually identify themselves to you? Was it like a, a visualization? I mean, I'm thinking that, in my intuition says the characters appeared to you in some way, like they actually did introduce themselves to you. Is that. Um, the, the, the characters themselves. So they kind of appear to me um, at, um, I'd say kind of as a, in a download <laughs> when I received right. the story to the book uh, 10 years ago, but they are, um, you know, that's an interesting question. Um, they are, uh, like a, we mentioned before, they are expressions of certain archetypes. And I'm just not sure, and it, 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 I don't even want to dwell on it, but I'm just really not sure where some of the aspects of the characters um, came from. Um, but I just, I had this yearning to express them as if they were 
a fully fleshed three dimensional uh, beings. Yeah, yeah like they're literally full, fully here, present. Yes, yes, Possibly. as if they're yeah. fully, fully here and fully present. And I think uh, eventually they they took on uh, lives of their own. So, uh, but it is told through uh, first person the story, and so Samuel ultimately has to. Uh, kind of, and there is this also this kind of interesting theme in the book about uh, free will or uh, 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 versus a predeterminism, predeterminism or predestination, um, which uh, Samuel has to come to grips with. Uh, and in a way, you know, the story is kind of uh, predetermined. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a little, gets a little bit meta because uh, Samuel questions if he's in this uh, uh, story that he's playing out this part that is kind of already pre-written. So it is kind of his story is a little pre-written, but part of what Sa Samuel has to come to realize is uh, he has to uh, transcend in a way this pre-written path. Um, and we do that by, um, by transcending our uh, egoic selves and, and, becoming more in tune with uh, the highest aspect of our own identities, uh, which would be, uh, call it God, call it the universal consciousness, call it uh, author consciousness. So Samuel, uh, in a way, he becomes aware that he, in a sense, has written uh, all of it, written the, the, the story, because he is uh, becomes kind of aware that he is in touch with this uh, divine consciousness, uh, which or, or author consciousness to use an analogy of, the, of, of a book. So that's also a very uh, interesting um, theme. But uh, yeah, it is, it is told through Samuel's perspective. Um, but uh, yeah, I, th I think uh, where, where, where that came from, I'm not sure. I think it was just, inf uh, just um, kind of influenced by uh, my own personal uh, passions and uh, at the time, and it, it, they, the characters have developed uh, sort of lives of their own. So that's a great, great question. But I, I, like many people who, who write novels, I, I don't even know like where um, the inspiration comes from. I try not to even like think of it as my own um, because I think that in a way, like um, I was you know, it kind of sounds kind of cliche, but it's true. Like I was kind of just this vessel that this idea that the story uh, came through and it was my job, kind of my duty to express it physically, express the characters in it physically and allow it to kind of grow on its own and now take life on its own. So I still feel a duty, a responsibility to this book to kind of let it fly and um, and but I do not really feel that it is my own. I don't really feel like I own it. I just feel like it kind of uh, came through me. So, yeah, not to sound so pretentious or anything, but yeah, it's true. I mean, I just feel like a, a vessel for for the ideas like many uh, people who, who talk about, uh, you know, who write books. I mean, there's so many uh, wonderful books coming out, especially in this community, talking about these uh, spiritual topics, which is, uh, I think is fantastic. And Terry had a question. <clears throat> so I, I do. So as you're talking about the book, um, are you connecting with that aspect, one of the aspects of yourself in the quantum field and connecting certain, um, a story that is a part of you in that quantum field, but then also how do you bring it back into your personal life and into what you do when you're in your teaching career and all that? Do you take that aspect of your quantum being and bring it back to teach your students when you teach um, aspects of being more than your physical body being being more and and do you encourage them to go into that space where you know we might say it's a create if some people would say it's that creative space and you have muses but we know that you're you're actually moving into a quantum field and connecting with 
different aspects of, of your being. So how do you, how do you bring that, that knowledge of yourself being able to connect in those quantum realms and bring it back and bring it into your, your everyday life and your, in your teaching and, and um, other aspects that you have that you're doing. Right. Great question, Terry. Yeah, I do believe we're constantly interacting with this quantum field of probabilities and even with alternate versions of ourselves. But uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza, he talks about this. I think to truly uh, connect with the quantum field in the most, um, uh, in the highest way, we have to kind of let go uh, of the self and enter the quantum field, enter the unknown as uh, as a no self, in a, to use Buddhist terminology, we have to transcend uh, our, ourselves. And it, uh, that's just another way of saying we have to be in the now. We have to be in the here and now because that's where uh, the magic happens. That's where I think we truly uh, manifest. And that's where the inspiration comes from when we are kind of an empty vessel and we allow the uh, creative inspiration uh, that comes uh, expresses itself in certain quantum potentialities uh, to manifest in its highest uh, in its highest way. Um, so that um, so <laughs> might have sounded a bit like a word salad, but I, I I hope you understood where I'm coming from. But yeah, my teaching. Um, uh, so that's another thing that I've been doing. So it, I have a day job. So uh, besides the book, I have a day job, kind of as a financial analyst. Believe it or not. So I'm using. Um, my left side of the brain a lot. Um, uh, but uh, what I love about uh, writing is kind of, it's kind of interplay between the left and the right side of the brain. And I also, besides writing, I also am a, uh, I've been working the past uh, almost two and a half years now, which is crazy to think about for uh, the Aramis Creative Learning Center, uh, which is, has, it's, has been founded by a uh, Sherry Div band. I'm sure you, you know, who uh, Sherry Div Band is, and we all hung out together at the last conference where she spoke about her educational endeavors. Uh, and I have been a huge supporter of that. It's really, I won't take credit, it's really Sherry's dream, but I've really been a huge supporter of uh, her mission uh, to revamp the educational system. And I think she's doing a fantastic job. So for the past two and a half years, uh, I've been working teaching virtual classes, mostly to children, but uh, to some adult classes as well about, yes, mainly about the potentialities of consciousness, because we're brought up in a system where, you know, these kids are taught, uh, they're, they're taught that, you know, they come from this materialist uh, worldview that consciousness isn't even something your own consciousness isn't something you really should pay attention towards it's just an accident we came from nothing we really have no purpose for being here we don't have a soul uh where we should just make money consume and uh die and that is no way to live and we have to um uh completely uh i i believe revamp the uh educational system to allow for uh creativity to come to allow for uh, discernment and critical thinking, which is sorely lacking in today's society. I'm grateful for my philosophy teachers for, for kind of instilling that this in me. And that's what I also instill to the children. I have taught many cool classes, but I never tell them what to think. I always, and I've received good feedback from parents who, who like this teaching style. I always help them to question and uh, figure out, things for themselves and use their own discernment and use their own uh, critical thinking while presenting them with uh, different options. So I've taught many cool classes for Aramis, uh, including uh, the potentialities of consciousness or even like do uh, exercises in telepathy and um, other fun games, uh, taught about the soul and reincarnation, um, about sacred geometry, about uh, extraterrestrials. I, I've done a class on that before um, about uh, ancient civilizations, for example, really everything, because, um, you know, that's another thing that we're taught, you know, we're taught that our whole over, we live on this earth that's billions of years old, according to mainstream science. And yet we only have um, 
recorded history up to like 5,000 years, up to like 3,500 BC. That's when civilization began, which I think, you know, in a planet that's um, billions of years old, you know, that's that's absolute nonsense. There has been civilizations that existed beforehand. And one, one of the things I, uh, in that class and other classes, I encourage the kids to question, to really uh, use their own discernment and, and question, like for example, uh, the Egyptian pyramids, um, you know, the people, the main street, what you, you learn about in school, which is absolute bogus, is that uh, they were built using like levers and pulleys um, and they were built for pharaoh, for uh, pharaohs to use as tombs. And uh, one thing that um, we need to understand is, you know, there's no mummies that have ever been found in them. There's no record of them ever being built if they were used as as tombs, uh, for, uh, if, the, if the Egyptians created these pyramids, <laughs> uh, which were the greatest archaeological feat in, in history, one of the greatest, then why why aren't there any records of them ever being built? You think that there there would be some sort of record? So it opens up the idea to certain ancient civilizations that predated the pyramids and the ones in Tiwatawakan as well. Many people don't know that, that uh, I show this in my class as well that. Uh, Mexico has its own huge pyramids, um, which I I visited, and uh, the those in Mexico as well. They were inhabited by the Aztecs later, but uh, the original builders um, they have almost no idea who originally built those pyramids. They have no idea about the civilization. Uh, they they were just founded by the Aztecs, but they were created by this unknown civilization that came uh, possibly thousands of years beforehand. So at least we should admit to ourselves in a Socratic sense, you know, people need to have this Socratic attitude about life, about everything that we do not know. And um, we were really born into this world. Uh, that's the foundation of, of self knowing, knowing thyself is realizing that in a sense, we, we know, don't know anything. And we have to uh, start from that uh, premise in order to really um, be open to, to new possibilities. So it's, it's been, a, uh, a wonder, and, and that's really what I try to stress to my the children as well. So it's really been a joy uh, teaching these kids, uh, and they they really uh, actually two of them, uh, uh, Aiden and Victoria, they were at the latest uh, Journey to Truth conference. I'm not sure if you you saw. Oh, them. I did see the pictures. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if if you've seen them and uh, their parents, but yeah, the, uh, Aiden. So one of these kids, Aiden. Um, so they're both very gifted, both Aiden and Victoria. And Aiden, oh, their parents only got into this stuff. Like speaking of star seeds, their parents were didn't know anything about this stuff. But the mother has told me they only got into this stuff because when Aiden was like two or three years old, he started talking about his previous lives on Mars. He started talking about his. Uh, he knew. Uh, which body he was in is on this tall body. He, he was, uh, he knew he was kind of like this. Uh, I believe he was a, a, a pilot. He started, he described the ships. He described, uh, being killed. Um, uh, he, he, he described, uh, he knew about inner earth. Uh, and this was the parents didn't influence him at all. And he was speaking about his previous lifetimes, uh, that were, uh, he still remembered and Steve still has memories uh, to this day, and he knows about the inner earth and uh, speaks about the Galactic Federation and so many cool things. And one of the things that I did at the conference was uh, connect him to uh, Lowell Johnson, who, who who has had an experience with uh, the uh, the inner earth. So I think uh, he even recorded a video with Aiden on his YouTube recently. I haven't watched it yet, but I, I did see uh, that he did have a conversation with, with Aiden. So, uh, so that's how the parents... Uh, actually got into it through their own kids. And I have shown Aiden uh, cool. Uh, I've, I've let him know that he's not alone. In fact, I've, I've let him, if you've ever seen the video, the Project Kamala video of um, Boriska, which was trending around uh, 2008. That was back when I was in high school and I was into this stuff at the time. He was another kid that grew up in Russia who became famous for talking about, you know, star seeds and having a life previously on Mars, which was, uh, devastated by war a millennia ago, and uh, he was, um, and and, and I uh, and I've and he said that many other children. He said back then many other children will continue to come uh, to the planet to help awaken humanity and prevent them from going down the same fate that Mars did 
and I, show, I actually showed that video to Aiden, and uh, he 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 really uh, he really enjoyed it. He also <laughs> enjoys a lot talking about inner Earth and extraterrestrials, and I've shown him uh, um, a lot a lot of cool stuff. But I don't want to influence their thinking too much. I want to allow them again to uh, make their own uh, decisions with regard to to anything. I, I uh, see what resonates for them because the biggest thing we must teach is learning to trust our own intuition and our own uh, discernment uh, with regard to to the, to um, to making our own choices. So, uh, actually, so anyway, that's answers that question. I actually have to migrate. <laughs> uh, so just give me one sec. I have to migrate to a different guy. Okay. Well, now we are. We're back. <laughs> we, we, we completely migrated. Yeah, and and my trigger finger is super fast with these buttons, so I'll be doing. <laughs> and so, well, hearing the story with Aiden, it makes me wonder about your own childhood. Uh, what if, did you come in with any, um, any perceptions? Like for myself, just as an example, I just felt strange like who are these people why am i with them i was constantly like really leaving and going <laughs> into the woods and, and into places that children shouldn't go and i was always getting in trouble and i um i would have recurring dreams i don't know if you what what type of experiences did you have i'm so glad i said that yeah <laughs> so when, when i was a kid growing up um yeah, I would have, you know, I've always kind of been, uh, you know, it took me a while to really get in touch with my uh, my inner sensitivity, but I was really sensitive as a kid. In fact, I was diagnosed <laughs> like as a problem with kind of this sensitivity, uh, quote unquote, disorder when I was a little baby because I would apparently I would cry in large crowds and I was just uh, really um, overly hypersensitive to, to everything. And I, I, I still kind of uh, like sensory? Are you talking yeah. about like sensory? In okay. Yeah, just being overloaded, uh, sensorial or overload, I guess you could say. Um, but um, yeah, so that that's but part of my journey is kind of learning to to honor that. And you know, I I, I have always kind of you know been born with this. Um, you know, I don't want to sound too like um, uh, you know. But, you know, it's it, like a cliche, but I, I've always kind of been born. Uh, I've always had this kind of inner rebellion, I guess you could say, against uh, the Matrix. Uh, if you know Charles Eisenstein, he speaks about this as well. Having just anti-establishment. Yeah. Just knowing that something is wrong with this world, like knowing that something is profoundly uh, wrong with society. Um, so even though I was a good student, you know, I, I was always questioning when I was a freshman in high school, I kind of, I woke up to the fact, you know, the government is lying to us. 9-11 um, was, uh, I woke up to the 9-11 truth movement as well, which helped me to really expand on questioning that. And, you know, if people don't know by now that uh, I know after 20 years that uh, there's something fishy went on with that event, then uh, I think then I, I, I won't bother to really describe why uh, three towers fell at free fall speed from, uh, two planes hitting them. I think you, you'd have to, <laughs> you, you still, you have to do your own research on that. But yeah, it kind of woke me up to the fact that we're, uh, we are being uh, lied to in a sense, and we all ha have been brought up in a. Uh, I get, we, we again, this goes back to the Socratic kind of humility of admitting to ourselves that re we really know nothing, and we were born into kind of this uh, this delusion. This uh, I I call it a control matrix where all our information is just dictated to us. And we, we hardly know what we're doing here or what our purpose is. We don't even know our own selves, our own souls. We think this is just an accident then we die. And I think that's, that's purposeful. And I do believe there's been a lot of manipulation here, uh, not only from humans, let's just leave it at that. I do believe there's been a lot of manipulation here to dumb us down and keep us in this control matrix, which we're now breaking free of. So I've, but I've I kind of always, had that intuition about me uh when i was like 15 i, I accidentally stumbled this gets into synchronicity onto a documentary about roswell 
and how you know this uh, this craft crashed in New Mexico that was initially admitted by military intelligence and shown on the front page papers, but later they changed it to a weather balloon. <laughs> and intuitively, after that documentary ended, I'm like, that, that definitely wasn't a weather balloon. So I looked at like I started doing my own research when I was like uh, 15, 16 years old about the ET subject. I realized all these like deathbed confessionals by people who were involved, high ranking military officials, Colonel Philip Perso, certain other military officials who were, were saying they were involved and there were, there were ET bodies recovered from the crash. Uh, you know, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, Clifford Stone, he speaks about being part of the crash retrieval programs. He's 23 year, year army veteran. He's been a, a long before David Grush. They've been speaking about these crash retrieval programs, how the government has been covering it up. So, uh, and I, I actually told, I remember telling myself back then, like, why don't people know about this? It was like, I stumbled upon this like incredible secret that like people need to know that like, Hey, we're not alone in this universe and that the government is lying to us. And we need to like awaken to the fact that we've all been, uh, manipulated and some of that man manipulation might not even be by by humans uh there might be a whole uh, we might be fighting uh, humanity here might be part of a millennia long proxy war between certain uh higher dimensional or extraterrestrial beings that we're or we're just a part of and that goes can go into uh, the, the genetic man manipulation as well which is also alluded to in my book um the fact that uh, our genetics have been tinkered with there's a reason why there's a missing link uh, in human evolution. There's a reason why we're we're um, we're so different. I do believe that there has been a long history of genetic ma manipulation, which has expressed itself in tales and mythoses throughout uh, hi throughout world history. Uh, the Aboriginal Australians and Native Americans, uh, you name it, they all talk about uh, the the Dogon tribe of Africa. They all talk about certain uh, extra beings who come from the sky, uh, of course, the Sumerians, uh, and influence them and influence, influence their culture. And uh, I think, you know, lots of these religious texts, they could be reinterpreted to, to uh, um, kind of a context of these <laughs> ETs coming and manipulating our society and manipulating, uh, pitting people against one another and um, uh, also tinkering with our genetics. But we do live in a world of duality. Uh, I, you know, not everything is dark, not everything is light. There's always a balance between the dark and the light. And that applies to humans. And that also, I believe, also applies to uh, non-human entities. People are waking up to the fact that, of the extraterrestrial presence, uh, which is great. People are waking up to the fact, but they're also waking up to the fact that we live on a tiny frequency band that we have called reality our whole life. Uh, we can only see a tiny fraction of visible light and it's an epitome of arrogance to think that we know everything based off of what we could uh, see with our limited senses. But people who are sensitive, who are waking up and attuning to these higher energies, they, they're picking up on, I believe, uh, you know, more uh, aspects of the quantum field. You could say they're attuning to uh, more realities that have always been there. You could call them multidimensional or interdimensional realities. And so I do, do believe that some beings or entities um, do reside in, in those certain frequencies that might not be initially uh, perceptible to the human eye. And, uh, and it's the classic angels and demons uh, whispering in our ears and uh, w which uh, side. Or, or, and I do believe we're, we're influenced by um, beings uh, in certain energies that are beyond our, our perception and um, and if you realize if you have enough humility to recognize all that we don't know and all we cannot see, it's really not that, that big of a stretch. So, yeah, that's basically, I don't know how I got to that, but that's my answer. And Terry, <laughs> exactly, because you are an orator. <laughs> you're not, you're not a person. Don't mess around and ask Mark a question, y'all, if you don't got um, some time. I know. <laughs> I know now we we know. Um, our next question would be, and Terry was was asking the natural progression because you had these senses as a child. How did your parents deal with you? Did how did they encourage you? And even now with the idea of you 
connecting with Aramis Creative Academy? Are they on board with your thoughts, views, and ideas? And did they help you along the way? Uh, so my parents, yes, my parents, uh, my, yeah, my, uh, my parents have been uh, helpful and, and encouraging. Uh, and, you know, my, my, my mother has always been uh, open to this stuff. I remember when she was a kid kind of calling me and uh, talking to me and uh, ask and, uh, you know, telling me about ESP, extra sensory perception. Wow. And she's, she's always been uh, interested. And my father as well, he, even though he's a scientist, he's very encouraging and uh, I shouldn't say even though, because I think in re in reality, you know, science and uh, uh, consciousness or spirituality and metaphysics, they all overlap to a certain idea. But my father as well has been very uh, encouraging and he's always encouraged me to to study and discern and to learn on my own, even if I didn't go into the exact same field, even if I am a bit uh, dealing with, quote unquote, stranger or metaphysical subject um, or more metaphysical, not uh, I guess you could call it a, not, not a, being a physicist, but a metaphysicist <laughs> uh, subjects. That I might don't be, know. Uh, do you oh, feel oh. that? Do you feel that it's that far off? Because I mean, being in the scientific field as they are, I'm sure they read journals or were connected to people that were doing those type of experiments. Even remember psychotropics and you know psychedelics and, and certain drugs were. This was a part of them learning, you know, to remote, like remote viewing seems new to us. But if we think, you know, back then, during your parents' time of their scientific journeys that people were doing that, you know, as, you know, maybe for the military, but still. Right. Yeah. My father had asked me about remote viewing because that's another class that I've actually taught for Aramis for adults. Yeah. Uh, I was taught by... Uh, a farsight instructor in remote viewing methodology, blind methodology, meaning you don't consciously know what the target is. Uh, last year, and I, I did 10 hours of private training in remote viewing. And after that, uh, I had to perform a test where I was emailed just an eight digit target number. And through only that number, I had to identify using the pen and paper process, uh, the main aspects of the target. And I'm very, I'm very, I was very actually happy with myself that I passed that. And I got the uh, Voyager certification in Farsight. And that's only the uh, <laughs> the initial uh, certification. Uh, so their, their methodology is very uh, rigorous. It's headed by uh, the Farsight Academy. Is, is, it's one of the Farsight Institute. It's one of the main uh, institutes that really helped me to wake up the power of consciousness many years ago. I was, I've been interested in remote viewing for many years. Dr. Courtney Brown himself, he's a PhD scientist. He's a professor at Emory University. He's a mathematician. So he is also very logical, but he applies these uh, aspects um, of uh, these uh, kind of the scientific methodology to, to, uh, to consciousness, to the, this technology of consciousness, which is remote viewing. And for those who don't know, remote viewing was started by uh, the program in the U.S. influenced by the Russians. It was started by two uh, physicists. Uh, if, yeah, you're right. The physicists, PhD physicists, are the one who uh, started the remote viewing program, Russell Targ and Hal Pudoff. And uh, they had many, much success at Stanford, researching at Stanford. Uh, their results, there's papers online at Princeton. You could look up. Their results were duplicated at Princeton. There's scientific papers you could look up there where uh, the replicability was was confirmed at Princeton as well as in Stanford. Uh, it was funded by the CIA and for years, and it was uh, picked up by the U.S. military uh, through Project Declassified uh, Project Stargate. So there, there was a whole military program of where they trained uh, military officers in uh, remote viewing um, through uh, through the uh, scientific methodology that they developed at Stanford. So that was a very a successful program and now it's coming to to public consciousness so to tie it back into my parents yeah they, they my dad has been interested in, in uh remote viewing and it's really just a way you know uh, for us to realize to to met, method uh, a methodology for us to um demonstrate the, these uh the, the non-locality of consciousness that uh, there is this aspect of consciousness that's beyond space and time uh that we could uh, tap into, we can kind of expand the receiver wavelength of the brain in a sense to to perceive more of what's not in our localized uh, field, but kind of tap into the quantum 
non-local field in a sense. And um, so, uh, so it, in a way, it is a, a very scientific methodology. So my father was interested in that. And he was also, uh, and by the way, my father's sister, she's also a, a kind of a sensitive person. And she has seen uh, uh, spirits, of, uh, in, including the spirit of my grandfather. When my grandfather passed suddenly, uh, she uh, saw him uh, before she knew what had happened. She saw him uh, standing beside my father and smiling. It's a whole story. Uh, so, you know, I think, um, you know, the, 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 and there's there's just so much um, evidence to point to the fact that we're, we're more near-death experiencers as well. There's so much scientific evidence out there to point to the fact uh, that our consciousness transcends uh uh, there's uh, transcends our bodies, you know, psychic perception, intuition, remote viewing, telepathy, uh, which we've all had experience with to some degree. I think these uh, it wouldn't even be possible without a foundation of a universal consciousness that pervades uh, space and time that we're each uh, connected to this non local, uh, non local field of, of consciousness and call it the quantum field or, or uh, whatever name you want to call it. Yes. So, the great question. Um, <laughs> apparently, um, I'm speaking too loud, um, so I'm going to. And my wife is no. getting. So I'm going to go to the, the other another room. If that's fine. Last thing that I personally would ask is, um, we know that you have the three books or the two preceding books in the future. Um, outside of this, what are your expectations? What are your desires or goals that you have set for yourself? Or are you kind of just going on the path to see what comes up? Is it, is right. it like the notepads are stacked up in one big room and you're like, I know I'm going to get to the, <laughs> the mastermind science of, of all these other projects or how, how is it flowing for you? Right. And that's kind of where faith and trust comes in and not kind of because our, our, our ego cells are so limited. I do believe there's an aspect of our cells or higher cells or souls in a way that could see beyond more a broader vantage point. And they're constantly is why it's so important to let that aspect of ourselves guide us through life instead of trying to control everything and control future aspects with uh, with our limited minds. So I kind of just seeing where everything takes me. I just want to kind of be an open, open vessel and allow what, uh, myself to help in whatever way possible, whether it be through the Aramis Center, whether it be through writing books or just, you know, speaking to people such as, such as you guys. But I was told, interestingly enough, so I've always paid attention to dreams. Uh, not lucid dreaming has been huge for me and also keeping a dream journal and dream interpretation. That's another uh, class I've taught at Aramis, by the way, lucid dreaming and dream interpretation. Uh, but um, uh, I was told actually in a dream years ago, I forgot how many years ago, maybe like three years ago, that I was, I was called, told very clearly it was manifested in the form of kind of like a, um, a uh, phone conversation that I was having. And, uh, and I was told uh, in your life, you're going to write uh, eight books. So <laughs> that, that's what I was told. And I'm like, eight, eight, uh, eight books. Like, uh, and, and um, uh, I, I was asking these questions and uh, I was told like, yeah, eight books, like um, the first one, yes, yeah, it's, it's going to do well, but uh, there's going to be questions. And then the second one would, will answer those questions. And I was kind of confused what that meant. Uh, at that time, but I've come, um, when I was for, first had the idea for the monarchs for my current book, I was, I was not planning to write a trilogy. I was just, um, planning to write a single book, but now I'm planning to write a trilogy. I finally understand what that meant that the second book will answer many of the questions that are left open, uh, in this first book. So it's going to be kind of a, a I call it a time bending trilogy. That's going to go through time, um, and it's going to be it's going to be really cool. Uh, but, you know, I, I do believe um, that dreams have uh, very important messages that could come from our, our higher selves. And, and it's up to us to interpret those messages. But uh, in a way, I, I kind of do believe that I <clears throat> I hope in a way that, uh, you know, I, I I guess I was told that I, if I'm going to write eight books, OK, that's part of uh, my purpose here. 
and uh, I don't, <laughs> in a way I'm like, okay, well, I don't think I'm going to exit this plane or uh, until uh, like I fulfilled what my purpose of writing eight books. So I think, uh, the, so this is going to be the, apparently the, if that message was true, then this is going to be uh, the first of eight. I don't want to be like completely uh, controlled by just what a dream told me, but you know, but uh, I do think that was kind of a message from my higher self telling me uh, what uh, one thing that I meant to do here is, is to write and to uh, communicate and express uh, this higher dimensional uh, teachings and wisdom within um, within a book form and within a form that's very that's entertaining as well and, and, and accessible uh, to the masses to it. So it's a very accessible book. Um, you don't have to be spiritually in tune or in this certain community or believe in aliens or star seas and all that to enjoy the book. But, uh, you know, that's kind of, kind of the point. I want it to be not, uh, I want, I want it to reach more than just our little echo chamber. I want to reach lots of uh, people. And the overall message is one of empathy and love and forgiveness. And, um, just, just, uh, trusting uh your heart trusting god and just being led by by uh by that higher aspect of, of yourself so and that's uh yeah so that's uh, uh samuel's evolution into you could call it uh, in the book you refer to it as kind of monarch awareness so uh in his own spiritual uh transformation but there's also a lot of other cool characters besides samuel including the one on the cover um and you'll, you'll see who that is once you read the book. Uh, but it does kind of allude to the fact that young children being born into this world, young star seeds, I think they're very, very gifted. Um, and they're coming into this world with a lot more gifts and insights than uh, older generations have. And we should learn to honor that. And just like Aiden's parents did, for example, when they heard him talking about his past lives as a non-human, you could uh, get the the kids on pills or you could you know have enough humility to admit that there's realities and dimensions out there you don't don't not understand and listen to these children and listen to to what they have to say and there's just uh, i think there's so so many special uh children out there there's this new wave of new youth uh, is coming and it's kind of inspired by dolores cannons uh waves of volunteers or star seas or wanderers or indigo children, whatever you want to call it, but that's that was one of the main inspirations to this for this book is to listen to uh, to acknowledge the fact that there's all these special gifted children coming in, and to to recognize and honor their gifts. And I've, I've been very blessed to to also be to to directly uh, talk with some of these children and teach them uh, through my classes with with Aramis. Um, so. If you want to know more about uh, Aramis Creative Learning Center, uh, you, you could uh, uh, Sherry Diffband, She's uh, uh, you could get in contact with her or go, go to uh, aramiscreativelearning.com. There's uh, lots of uh, new mentors that not just me, but Sherry hired and we're doing virtual classes and uh, she's always looking for funding as well. It's a great, I think, mission to support. She eventually wants to open a physical center in Florida and uh, I, we're, we're currently on a summer hiatus, but we will be having classes, virtual classes start up again, I think within the next uh, couple months. So be on the lookout for that. Um, and if you want my book, it uh, says promotion, um, you could find it on, on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, a, a whole bunch of other uh, retailers. And uh, it's currently available. To, it's coming out later this month, but it's currently available uh, to to order. So I, I hope that you know I don't want to have too many expectations. You know, that's another thing we have to kind of let go of is expecting uh, uh, so much, uh, expecting uh, some outside circumstances to be in order to feel content or happy or self worthy. Well, part of our own spiritual journey is recognizing that there's an aspect of ourselves that's already complete that's already perfect, that's already worthy, that's already divine. And, uh, uh, that's, uh, and that's where I think true contentness comes from. So this is all to say that I don't want to have too many expectations uh, regarding the book. Like it doesn't have to be a bestseller for me to be happy about it. I just wrote it because uh, I just felt a strong purpose 
I really enjoyed the journey itself of writing this book. It's, it was very therapeutic. And I, I just hope that uh, if it helps people, uh, if it changes even one person and helps them see things from a different perspective, then I will be happy with, uh, with myself. So. Okay, Mark. So I lied. I said that was the last question, but I do have one more. Anyway, this is uh, very correctly titled Unlocking Consciousness. This is really amazing. Um, my, <laughs> my thought right now is this. There are people like you who have an amazing appetite for learning and reading and a lot of energy that you have ideas and things on your plate. How do you organize this mentally? Because there has to be something mentally, um, a mechanism device that's internal that you can use that says, I can put my book writing on this shelf and I have my home, I have my job, I have my my um, my work, and then I have another job and you keep a lot in here, it's, it's a lot. How do you organize and function that you can pull these certain things off the shelf at the right or proper time. How do you organize your life around these many, many things that, you know, because the mind can run wild with information and digging and learning. And then the mind can run wild with, you know, um, I'm working on my book. I can't do anything, you know, like, you know, we can become obsessed about any area of our life. What have you done to maintain this? Well, that's a great question because there is, is a lot that's going on and the mind can very easily be overwhelmed and it's about surrendering. So all that is to say, stop trying to organize so much within the mind and surrender to where the higher awareness that uh, is guiding you and beating your own heart, where that's uh, takes you and being open to being guided by intuition rather than up here. And uh, it, it is very overwhelming. You know, there's a lot with a book, with my, the Aramis, with my own day job, with my own personal responsibilities. I just got married also. Yeah, so, you know. And congratulations, because I did see that you guys just got married. Thank you. Yeah. So it, it is, uh, you know, life is a journey and uh, we all have, you um, you know, responsibilities. And it's, it, it, I, I just feel honored. I just try to take it moment by moment. So that's where we have to be in this moment because there is no other moment to be. So we can't mm. uh, so project our future scenarios and outcomes <laughs> and try to mentally control everything, um, which is in a sense futile. We have to just be in, uh, of course, you know, I'm, no, I'm not perfect. I always slip up, but uh, part of spiritual awakening is just realizing you know, there is no other moment, but now here and now might as well be in it and surrender to and allow a higher intelligence to guide your actions in whatever form that means to you. Uh, try to let go and try to uh, surrender rather than trying to control everything. So uh, trusting, surrendering um, and releasing and allowing that uh, higher consciousness to dictate your life is a big lesson that I've had to learn and also Correspondingly, it's a big lesson that Samuel uh, learns within the novel. Um, so that's yeah, that's a huge uh, spiritual lesson, I think, for for all of us. And it's very, very, very tough lesson because the ego constantly wants to control and to know everything, but it <laughs> and it doesn't want to admit to itself that it's in a way it's 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 an it's illusory. <laughs> the need to control, to know, to uh, project future scenarios to uh, kind of organize everything mentally. There has to be a balance between kind of setting goals and expectations. And there's a very uh, useful aspect to that, to, to, uh, to um, you know, uh, the mind to, um, to organizing and setting goals and expectations. But it very easily, if you allow it to be in the driver's seat, it very easily devolves into overthinking and a uh, useless thinking and needing to control everything. So there has to be a balance and a, at a certain point, we just need to uh, 
to let go and see where the moment takes us and see where the day takes us in whatever way our, our, our souls or our higher selves wants to guide our own vessels to be of service. So that's kind of how I, I view life at this point. Well, that's amazing. Um, this website, nothing to do, no, nothing to doubt.org. Yeah. Is that a valid website? Yes, that's www.nothingtodoubt.org. I created that when I was like, um, maybe like uh, 10 years ago. So it's kind of wow. a blog that I have on the side. I don't post on it too often, but if you do want to go on there, you can see some posts that I've made. There's posts I made, for example, about quantum physics, about there's a most recent post I made was about my book and the process of writing it uh, and also about identity in general, uh, if you want to check that out. So that's just a short post that I made. So you could go on there. It also has links to the book. So www.nothingtodoubt.org. If anyone we just wants you, to contact me. We got you me, rolling on the bottom, Mark. We got you scrolling across the screen. Cool, cool. Okay, yeah. yeah. If anyone wants to contact me, they could go there or they could just uh, contact me through my own personal email, which is msabbas92 at gmail.com. So msabbas92 at gmail. They could also just send, shoot me an email if they have any questions or they, uh, they want to uh, contact me for, for anything. But I would uh, appreciate, you know, again, I, I don't um, – want to sell anything or have any expectations but you know if you if you want to purchase a book i would appreciate that and if you read it leave a review that that helps and uh also some more support the uh the aramis center as well because that's a very uh, noble mission that that uh, sherry and the rest of the 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 mentors are endeavoring on to and it's going to i think in 20 years time we're going to see a whole the collapse of the old system the uh, beginning of the new. So that's another major theme of the book, kind of entering into uh, a new age and a, a new earth. So <laughs> that's, uh, we'll just have to wait for book two for more on that, but yep. So any other questions or <laughs> this has been okay. a great, by the way, I, I've really enjoyed talking with you guys. And Good. I know. Really you know, we, I always see you and then it's like, but we, we never have like this time where we actually sit and, and talk. So this was amazing, man. Um, we opened up a box here and I hope nobody takes that as an insult. It's just, you have to see this man in public <laughs> it's like, and he's like, Hey, you know, and, and, and then to actually open the door and it's like, there's a, there's a mansion inside, you know what I mean? Like to listen to you talk, just to hear all, you know, like you're saying, we have this human self, but in here it's right. way, it's way big in, inside the mind that you have. It's he's, very he's like, he's like the title is in, in Dr. Who. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You guys are flattering my ego and uh, decreasing oh, yeah. my, my spiritual growth. Though. So thank yeah. you. Did you say decreasing or increasing? Going down my my spiritual growth by flattering my ego. <laughs> oh, well, flattering you your spiritual self. Mm -hmm. Respect. Yeah. We're, 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 you know, it's the higher self oneness, right? Acknowledgement, yeah, yeah, so, we're, we're all knowledge. powerful, multi dimensional beings. That's yeah. just the, really the main message. We're powerful, multi dimensional beings, and we're more, Absolutely. much more than just this meat yeah. suit. We're connected yeah. to the stars for sure. We're connected, I think, anyone yeah. listening to this, we're, we're all star seeds, and we're or, we all have that awareness, this uh, Even, higher dimensional awareness to bring town to, to earth. And I think we all chose to be here at this time to, to yeah. help. A humanity to help um, Earth uh, kind of transition into a new way of doing things. Yeah. I think all, and, all souls, and, and, yeah. And the universe has a way of connecting us. Yeah, even those that we see that the door is un not unlocked yet. If you see someone unlocked, respect that person where they're at because that they, you you just really don't know. Once that door opens, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. wow! That's what I really enjoyed about Sherry's story. Is you know. You wouldn't see, but once that surface was scratched and all was revealed, it's like, now we have a, a new school, you know? Yeah. 
So yeah. I enjoyed it. Um, I'm very impressed. This sounds like an amazing book. Um, to compare it to Harry Potter, it just almost sounds bigger than that. You know what I mean? To me, it just sounds like more vast than that, even more so because of the lessons and where where the where the messages are going. So I'm really looking forward to that. And I hope people buy the book. And this will be released on June 25th on the day of your book. So yeah, currently available for 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 pre-order pre-order though. So. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. So have a good night. I know you got it's past your bedtime. I don't want you to get in trouble. No, yeah, well, was, I already got into a little bit of trouble with my wife. So I feel like a fire over there. <laughs> well, we're going to say good night. All right. I really appreciate oh. the opportunity. Thanks for everyone listening. I'm going to say Thanks. don't hang up, but I'm going to say good night. Okay. Okay. You understand? okay. Yeah. Good night. Good night.